Hey, everybody. I'm Tom Cottingham, CEO of Flyover Future. Thanks for joining us in another one of our conversations with founders um, in the Louisville region who are finalists in the Vote Awards. And today we welcome um, Dan Rossley, um, the founder of Athena. And Dan, thanks for joining us. And, thanks for having uh, nice me. Nice to have you. Um, so tell me and the audience a little bit about the Vote Awards and um, the process that you've gone through. Um, cause I know it's, there's a lot of competition. Yeah. So, uh, the vote awards, it's a, it's a great program based here in Louisville. Um, uh, there's some requirements to it. I won't, but you can look them up, but I think it's, you basically have to be in Louisville, uh, and they give you $25,000 non-dilutive, which is to any founder that's like music to your ears. Um, right. but, but more importantly, they give you a, they also have a 10 week accelerator program and we, we just finished week two of 10. Um, it's every Thursday. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the publicity and the networking and all the the soft, uh, besides the hard cash, all the soft networking you get is is super valuable. And amongst the three of like, you know, trying to get you know, trying to get startups, especially tech enabled startups off the ground in Louisville. It's a great program. Uh, there's six winners every year. Um, and so it's a real home run for any founders out there because you get money with no equity to give away. You know, you right. get uh, a great network opportunity. So if you need early supporters, more investors or um, advisors or contacts. It's a, it's a great network. And then third and most importantly, the Excel or part importantly is the accelerator program to help you get your startup off the ground. I would say uh, I, I don't want to qualify. The Excel Everything's great. But I think the first thing you gravitate is the non-dilutive equity because right. for, yeah. for any tech enabled startup, you're like, oh, that is awesome. And it's right. definitely worth it. Yep. Right. Yeah. It's a great program. And I, it's been around, I think, 23 years, Yeah, which is pretty incredible. Um, so tell us a little bit about your company, Athena, and you are a digital ticket office, um, mobile first, I think. Yeah. And um, so tell tell us a little bit more about what that means and what your uh, USP is. Yeah. So uh, we're Athena. We're um, we do tickets. We do live event tickets. Um, and our goal is to just really streamline that POS experience, the point of sales experience for uh, any live event. Um, I, we always alluded to like, we want to be the toast tab of tickets, right? You shouldn't know we exist and it should be a super clean process for you as the event host. And I think one experience you, you know, it's, it's been over a year, but the Taylor Swift is still making headlines, right? Of what a Crazy. poor purchase experience that is for a ticket. Right. And people don't realize that ticketing is actually just like any POS system. It's just, that's not the event, right? The event, the show, that's the actual asset, the good right. purchasing the ticket <laughs> for some reason is making as many headlines as, as the actual event. And we see that as a major problem. Uh, now, of course, like today we can't start, you know, we can't start ticketing Taylor Swift. So our go to market strategy is more focused on medium sized GA events. Basically, if you're a small to medium sized business, if you have tickets, you collect sales tax and you have a, a ticket office and you're looking to drive revenue through, like you're our customer and we'd love to talk to you. But more importantly, we're delivering a, a product that is strictly focused on ticketing your POS system to give you the money that you sell from your tickets and enable greater revenue, more streamlined reporting and a seamless admission process. Interesting. And, and you're like any kind of POS system where you have to be worried about the end user experience, and that's super important. But the end user isn't really your customer, right? Correct. Your customer is the venue owner. Correct. Yes. So our yeah, that's our customer, and I think that was a a big realization we have compared to most other ticketing platforms. I think a lot of people get into ticketing because they get they they come at it from the fan perspective, right? And they think, hey, how do I make the fan better experience? But at the end of the day. The fan does have a huge say in the buying decision, right? But they make it through the host, right? And the host is the one who has to decide like, hey, how how do I make that trade off between paying a premium for a better customer experience versus, um, you know, my bottom line? And, and we right. try to deliver both a great customer experience at a very affordable price. That makes sense. But the ticketing industry, as we think about it, is really dominated by just a couple of ginormous players um, right how do you intend to make inroads into that market i mean obviously like you said you're not going to be getting taylor swift um but there are thousands of events every day in america right yeah there's thousands there's thousands of events every day it's just an integral part of the human experience right uh when you think about like a restaurant uh restaurants hotels flights and then going to shows like why are you going to get the hotel room going to the 
uh, getting a flight to somewhere. It's to probably experience something. And so our unique value proposition is, hey, we focus strictly on the ticket, right? Uh, we go to events and we say, uh, you there's already best in class solutions for email marketing for uh, CRMs. Like we don't need to be a comprehensive event management solution. We just need to be a comprehensive ticketing solution. And that's the reason we chose digital ticket office, not event management. Um, right. We we just focus strictly on the ticket, strictly on how do you drive more revenue through ticketing. And then more importantly, uh, from my background is this data enablement, data capture and data enablement. Uh, and that's really where we're going to see a lot of value add for our customers is just the knowledge that like, you know, as with most uh, transactional systems, um, one is you have to be able to do it, right? So a lot of companies don't even do that well, right? Like right. you have to be able to host a website that can, at the end of the day, process the Handle the traffic, right. Right. So we can easily say like our first uh, value proposition is we can do it. We can handle 10,000 people coming to your site or coming to our site and selling 10,000 or whatever volume you need, right? We can just do, I call them table stakes. And when your competition can't do that well, it's like, all right, like that's, that's a pretty low bar but more like the second and the third hurdle. And you see these parallels in other industries is since everything is digital now, you have this huge avenue to capture data, right? And right. then beyond that, beyond just being a, a large repository of data, how do we enrich the data to drive your business metrics? And and that's really my background as a trader was, you know, taking data in and then processing that information into driving, you know, driving better pricing decisions, more revenue. And so that three-tiered approach of like, you know, we can do the table stakes, right? You should be able to buy a ticket when you hit checkout. That should be a, a 99.9% .9 process, not a 60% process, right? Right, right. Uh, and then capture the data so you can make better informed decisions. And then the last piece is kind of filtering that data, processing, enriching it. So that way we can deliver, you know, pricing suggestions to you as a turnkey solution rather than, you know, expect you to be able to be the data scientist behind there, behind the scenes, you know, being able to make those really analytical decisions, we just deliver them to you straight through as a recommendation. Right, because the challenge, as I understand it, is there's so many intermediaries between the venue owner operator and the ultimate ticket holder that there's a dearth of data, right? Yes. They don't really know um, mm -hmm. if the scalper buys 30 tickets, they don't know who that scalper's selling them to and who those people might be selling and we're giving them to. And right. so what you're trying to do is get rid of all of that layer or those layers and then allow the venue operator to have direct access to who is buying their tickets and the data around that. Right. Is that yeah, I the mean, there, there will still be people that buy mass quantities of tickets to scalp, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but ultimately you're trying to close that gap. Right, right. And I think... We talk about you look at the revolutions over in retail with the direct to consumer movement, right? And being able to eliminate wholesalers, distributors. Um, we're trying to do the same thing analogous in ticketing is saying, you know, these functions, uh, whether willingly or unwillingly, uh, were necessary when the paradigm was physical tickets, right? And physical goods, and you needed that network effect. Um, but we can really just take the same playbook as the digital revolution in retail and say, hey, we can sell, uh, we can be a D2C enablement tool for you, the host, right? We build that infrastructure for you to deploy directly to your consumer or to your fan. Um, and then the value is one is you eliminate all the middlemen from a, a revenue perspective, right? But the other aspect is that the data capture element, right? Um, right. Which uh, are the two parallels. So we look to execute kind of the same playbook in uh, that's revolutionized the retail space, right? And bring that back into the uh, the ticketing space. And our our goal is uh, again not to you know launch our own brand in that sense, but really just to be more of a Shopify, an enablement tool for you to carry your your uh, your business into a, a digital first uh, a digital first uh, uh, delivery system. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you almost be white labeling it, right? Yes, correct. Right, mm -hmm. um, which makes a ton of sense. Does anybody have data on what is the delta between um, the retail price of a ticket and the ultimate price that it's sold to by the person that actually attends the event? I mean, I wonder how much revenue is left there. It is. Right? It is absolutely astounding. And there's a huge. So, uh, I, again, I used to work for StubHub. The, the resale industry itself is $10 billion, right? So that is resale ticketing. Uh, and that's only resale ticketing on 
uh, centralized exchanges, right? Uh, like the StubHub, the Ticketmaster, the SeatGeek. Um, there's estimated that 50% transacts off-platform on Craigslist, you know, on Facebook sure, Marketplace. Right. Just right? Tom going down and buying 20 tickets and selling yeah. them on, online. And, and, right. and Tom says, like, I don't want to pay a 40% transaction fee on StubHub, I'm just going to put in the elbow grease and, and do Facebook marketplace. And then just meet me at the coffee shop down the street or something, or I'll mail them to you. you right. Know? Um, and that's, that's expected to be about 50%. So that's a, probably a $20 billion. $20 billion. Wow. Yeah. It's cra And that's secondary marketplace, right? That is none of that goes back to the host. Um, yeah. And in terms of the, or the, or the artist or the artist. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of values lost. Um, or not lost, but not going back to the originators of the good. Right. Um, and there's, there's a huge 80-20 principle between who who is losing out, right? So um, when I was at StubHub, the data just shows like you can have, you know, you can be, I would say like a team, like a professional sports team or an, even a, a musician, right? You're going to have areas with higher disposable incomes, right? If you go to New York, LA, if you're touring there, like, the disposable income there is much higher than in, you know, flyover America, right? Right. Um, and then because uh, you're doing a tour, you're going to have to make all these different stops. So even with like um, a mid-sized artist, like you don't know how to price, you don't know how to price the Bay Area on a Saturday night, right? Um, but then when, so, but you might lose the, you might have tickets going at a five, six, it's not unusual, a 10, 10x multiple in those areas. Because the secondary market's so prolific, right? right, and disposable income is so high, uh, and then you take a tour stop in, you know, Louisville, Kentucky, right, and you're still probably going to sell out, right? But um, the amount of transactions on the secondary would probably be much less. Um, so you could ultimately price tickets kind of like airline price seats. Exactly, and I think that's which is interesting. Yeah. Yes, it is. I think the big change that enables this feature for hosts is that that's the world we live in now, right? Like. Uh, a lot of artists are um, very concerned about, you know, the the optics of uh, what would be termed dynamic pricing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the reality is sinking in that if you don't do it, somebody else would, right? Like people right. In the market that you have no control over, right? right. And they're so, going to be charging a thousand dollars for your tickets instead of six hundred dollars or whatever, right? Right. Or um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's a ginormous opportunity. So. Mm -hmm. So you're building a, a tech platform, essentially, mm -hmm. um, and tech talent has got to be an important part of um, your overall uh, staffing. How's that been in Louisville? One of the things, you know, we're flyover future, and talent is a huge issue in flyover country. It's actually a huge issue everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit about how you've been able to acquire talent and how that's gone in, in a city like Louisville in that region, Southern Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, there's, there's a couple of theses we operated on, um, but the overall message is like, there is talent here, right? I, I would say there's, there's a three-step problem to how do you solve the talent issue? Right. Um, and our thesis is um, one is like, we don't need actually, you don't need that many engineers, right? You just need a handful of really, really great, really engineers. good ones. Yeah. Right. 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 So it's, it's a quality problem, not a quantity problem. The second thesis is um, uh, that, you know, big areas like the Bay Area where we, you know, I, I talk about like you're hiring talent from the world, right? You could easily have 200 engineers from 80 different countries like that. Right. Uh, and so it's only unique. It's unique to the Bay Area and maybe New York, right? Where you can get an international, like the competition is international, right? Right. I would say places like Austin or Colorado is, the or Chicago, like the competition is national, right? Or regional, right? Um, right. People, you know, you're not going to go from, you know, you're not going from Shanghai to Austin. You're going to Shanghai to San Francisco. And and that's kind of, so it's not, and the places like Louisville is usually areas where you get a lot of brain drain, right? Like, mm -hmm. but the thesis is um, you just need to stop the brain drain, right? Like right. there's quality talent here. And I, I joke uh, with you, with everybody too, that like I used to live in Norfolk, Virginia, right? I met more software engineers from Norfolk, Virginia in San Francisco than I did in Norfolk, Virginia, right? So <laughs> like, no, we export. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things about flyover countries, I mean, you've attended yeah. uh, University of Chicago. We have great universities, mm. um, not necessarily the density, but world-class. I think they're 
18 world, you know, make the top 100 world class universities in flyover country. Um, mm -hmm. But we export that talent to San yes. Francisco, to New York, to Austin. Yeah. And while it may be difficult to move somebody from San Francisco to Louisville, it's not nearly as difficult to move somebody from Indianapolis to Louisville. Right. right. So that regional um, attraction and retention becomes super important. So okay. who, where are you finding talent? So we, we source directly locally from the University of Louisville, right? right. Uh, our thesis is, one, we can train people so long as they have the right mindset, the right ability. Um, and technology is just constantly changing. So like every four years, it's something different. So you're, yeah. you're really just looking for somebody who has the ability to learn very quickly, the aptitude, rather than uh, that comes with a stock of knowledge. I mean, ChatGPT came out for us like six months ago. And to me, that was like revolutionary. It's like, sure. yeah, now, I, now I need to be able to ask questions better. Right. And be inquisitive rather than um, in, uh, knowledgeable, if that makes sense. Right. Um, so we source locally. Um, it's been a, we have a great pipeline of individuals coming through. And I think as part of the one, two punch, it's like we're we're trying to build a, a unicorn tech enabled startup. But more importantly, like we want that to focus on economic development. And I always say, like, the biggest success of our startup isn't the what we exit at. It's will we have the next hundred great, you know, tech engineers, tech founders come through our company. Yeah. yeah, and spreading that DNA is really rewarding, I think. And and you'll also probably spawn some uh, startups as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's great. I think it's um, really important what you're saying. And and we talk a lot about the talent stack. We used to talk mm -hmm. about a tech stack, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the reality is, is, if you come out of university with a degree in computer science, um, you got to immediately start adding to your tech stack and it could be something very specific, like what does your employer want you to learn? But, yes. it, but it's very rarely your current domain expertise because that's going to change so fast. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you look at chat GPT. I mean, I, I know people well who have been in software companies that have been developing AI solutions for the last several years. Mm -hmm. Right. And all of a sudden there's 10 startups using, you know, chat GPT yeah. for, doing exactly what they were trying to build. Yeah. Right. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. So I think the idea that you can train people if they have the aptitude and you're willing to put the, in the time to really mm -hmm. train them um, mm -hmm. is a great model. Um, and keep yeah. them in the region is yeah. a great model as well. Um, finally, I guess, you know, we can talk about what you would do at 25 grand, but the bigger question, I guess, is what are your big challenges and, like all entrepreneurs, you know, we're always raising capital, but uh, assuming you had more capital, where would you deploy it? What are you focused on for the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, I think the the big thing you learn about being in flyover country as a founder is you got to be really lean and you got to focus on revenue, right? right? And so our focus is, I got that hammered to me and we have a wonderful slate of uh, angel investors and um, venture investors as well. But I think... Uh, it, it was fortunate that we got them, but the message is clear. It's just like, you need to get revenue, right? And we can't live in the fantasy world. Uh, if you're in flyover country, you you can't live in the fantasy world of, uh, you just walk down Sand Hill and, and somebody will write you, you know, one of the hundred people will write you a million dollar check. Right, um, we'll go get fancy office space and, yeah, you know, yeah. lat latte machines and all exactly. that. Exactly. You, you we gotta don't do that here. Yeah, you got to be lean and you got to um, you got to go after revenue. Right. And it just it gives you a ton of clarity on the objectives of a business. Like there is no there's no dancing around the fact that, um, you know, revenue is king. Revenue has always been king. Um, I think there's a, a blip in the the last, you know, during the covid bubble of the idea was king or the founder was king. Right. Or um, and now the it's just you know, yeah. I've been in this business so forever and this is the pendulum that swings a whole lot. You're right. Um, you get into the matrix where all of a sudden it's not about revenue. It's about an idea. Um, I mean, you know, we work as a classic example of that. Right. Right. Um, yeah. You, you looked when we work with scope was roaring. Mm. I realized there were like two or three companies in Europe that have been doing what they were doing for yeah. decades. Yeah. And so you look at what their stock price was and it was, you know, a reasonable multiple and stuff. And you're like, the rest is all high. And, yeah. and now it's, I think, $400 million. So yeah, in, in flyover country, we don't care about the hype. It's what have you done? You know, what'd you do today? Yeah. Um, and,
and uh, I got saw horses and some boards we can make dust <laughs> out of. Right? Like, don't yeah. go buy air on chairs or buy exactly. them on eBay. Um, and uh, so, uh, so you're lean and mean, but you've still got um, money that you need to raise and things you need to do. What's yeah. your focus is going to be? What now on on talking to customers? Talking to customer, you know, we I. I like to make the distinction. Uh, our goal is to get revenue, right? Be revenue positive, be a profitable company. We're super lean. We hire local. One other advantage per previous is it's relatively cheaper, right? People right. are cheaper. They're more, more, more motivated relative to the coast. Um, and the goal is like right now we have, I would call users, right? Um, they use a product. They create events. Um, they, they're they non-revenue events, if that makes sense. Where right, they're sure. doing it. Yeah, there's a, tons of those. Right. Yeah, side business. And it's been great for us to get reps through the products. Um, our focus now is trying to pivot over to the revenue aspect of like, are you ticketing for revenue as their primary means of business, right? And how do we be your ticketing provider in that front? Uh, and that should flow into our business model and our revenue and drive revenue to us as a business. But the whole focus is like, how do we go from, you know, the Paul Graham of just incessantly like being, have you launched? Have you launched? Like we've launched, like we're in, the product is live, it's wild. How do we keep pushing? And and our goal from now is, you know, what we talk about, how do we get to Taylor Swift? You know, it, there right. is 50 steps, right? And I think what's more important is like, how do we get from 50 to 200? Like, how do we really fine grain articulate? How do we go from here where we are today to there tomorrow? And the goal tomorrow it, and the focus for the next 12 months is like, how do we get revenue? How do we satisfy that condition? Um, you know, and we're going to break that up even smaller to like, my first objective is like, how do we get a consistent recurring stream of paid tickets? Right. And that's kind of the one a approach is like, you might be a business that has that hosts, um, like, you know, brewery tastings, things like that. Sure. Where right. It's, it's not our primary business of ticketing events, but you, we do a hundred tickets, uh, once a week kind of thing. And for us, like that's good revenue, right? Like that's good revenue. Yeah. It's right. real money, and it's also a way to get the product out there and in people's yeah. hands. And um, no, I, I totally get it. And um, you know, I think it's going to be an interesting pivot for you personally going out and talking to clients. It's hard when you've created a product, but it's the most valuable thing you can yeah. do. Yeah. Um, well, I I think it's really exciting that you've come to Louisville. Um, I know a little bit about your story and you moved here because you've got a, a wife who actually has a job that pays money um, as opposed yeah. to being a founder okay. yeah. work, working for free. Uh, but, you know, you came to Louisville and decided that you could build it here and you're doing that. And now you're a finalist for the vote awards. And uh, it's a great story. And I look forward to uh, following you in the future and and tracking your success. I love the way you break down things. Um, mm -hmm into actionable, doable um, items. And I think your approach is, is a really smart, uh, well thought that. out approach. So <laughs> I wish you great luck. Hey, I thanks think, uh, a lot yeah. to Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. Your toddler did not appear, so um, yeah. kudos to him. And uh, yeah, well, Tom, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I, was, I just go back to like, uh, some people, I, I drive some people nuts by my hyper logical, you know, take it and break it down. Um, but yeah, I appreciate, appreciate the compliment. It's refreshing to hear too. So, and well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about it earlier, but it's so hard to separate the urgent from the important, right? Mm -hmm. We're always focused on who's ever making the most noise. And sometimes you just need to break things down and say, no, actually, this is not on the list. You know, we're not going to worry about that fire right now. Let it burn. Um, and, you know, everybody rushes to whatever the fire is. And yeah. You need a leader who can be really clear and break things down into understandable um, steps and goals. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you do that. And that keeps people pretty focused because it's so easy to lose focus in a startup. Believe me. No. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, no, I feel I feel it. I'm fighting that every day. I, I, no, no, it's it's, it's yeah. a constant battle. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, great talking to you and, uh, and good luck again. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for the time. And yeah, it's great. Right on, man.